chapter 36. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. I have spoke with the tongue of angels. I have heard the hand of a devil was warm in the night. I was cold as a stone. The white dude who would do more than most white dudes in the music business to help break hip-hop in America, the most important musical force since the Beatles reinvented rock and roll. The man who would bring streaming to Apple, the successful producer who would partner and befriend one of the most significant producers of the century, the rapper Dr. Dre, formerly of N.W.A., and build an empire with him by positioning Beats headphones as a cultural badge. The white dude who more than any I have known in the music business has fought for the expression of black genius and its rightful remuneration. This dude is about to reveal some of the key characteristics that will explain why one day he will accomplish all of the above. He is offering a cautionary tale about musical tourism and what these days some might call cultural appropriation. In short, white guys dressing up in the genius of black music without a real understanding of the music or its context. And until we remind him of the very good reasons we all decided to come here, well, he'd rather not get off the bus. Now, to be fair to him, The bus is not at our destination, which is a church attempting to contain the fire of a gospel group called the New Voices of Freedom. On the way to this destination, I have asked to stop the bus at a random street corner, a corner that looks kind of cool, where some cool activities are going on. I would like the record of this trip to have some atmospherics as well as cinema verite. Bono, this is the part of Harlem that's not for tourists. I have too much respect for this place to turn up as part of a film crew and stick cameras in the faces of these folks. You're Irish, he continues. You want to take some photos? Good for you. I am Italian. Believe me, I grew up in Red Hook, Brooklyn, and Italians are not natural neighborhood hoppers. We didn't stray far from where we got off the boat, you know. We know where you stop and where you start. He's not finished. New York, in the 70s, it was territorial. You entered someone else's territory. You, you want to have a good reason. Are you sure we're not wasting these people's time? Because there's a part of me, as you well know, that is still in the 70s. Are you suggesting, I ask, we might not be serious enough or cool enough to be here? A bit of both he says. Look, I understand why we're here. You want to record this choir? By the way, it's a white guy who organizes the choir. I'm not saying it's impossible for white-ass music people to be cool here, but you need a certain pass, a certain composure, a certain respect. Edge, Larry, Adam and I are wondering what happens next if our producer chooses not to get off the bus. Just leave me here for a minute to get my attitude together. I'll get used to it. The Irish Abroad This man is Jimmy Iovine, and he's in Harlem with us to record a gospel choir. The new voices of freedom are going to sing on I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For and then join us on stage at Madison Square Garden. This is a bit of a moment in our late 1980s genuflection to American music because gospel is as close to the heart of rock and roll as the blues, central to the quest for a deeper understanding of where this rock and roll music came from. Jimmy Iovine is overly self-conscious about being a white dude in Harlem. We probably aren't self-conscious enough. We're innocents abroad, wandering into church, thrilled by the possibility that our own gospel song might be about to find another level. (laughs) 